we've just looked at various properties, especially graphical properties, of our functions cosine and sine. So now what I want to do is to look through kind of general properties, things like domain range and all the rest. So let's go through the general properties. of cosine and sine. Okay, so as always, let's on the left have the property and on the right have some sort of comment on it. So first of all, the domain, everything. So the domain of both sine and cosine is all real numbers. And that's, of course, because of the definitions of cosine and sine. So we carefully defined what cos of theta and sine theta. We define what they meant. They make sense for every theta in minus infinity to infinity. And remember why, what theta is. Theta is thought of as an angle. A winding angle where you wind around either counterclockwise or clockwise around the unit circle. So that's perfectly fine for any number because if you're between 0 and 2 pi it kind of makes sense because you're an angle but if you're bigger than those or outside of that range then you're just winding either counter either clockwise or you're doing more than one revolution. So it makes sense for absolutely any number at all so the domain is the entire thing. Range. Well, the range, of course, for both of them is the closed interval from minus 1 to 1. So in particular, you're bounded above by 1 and bounded below by minus 1. Bounded above by 1 bounded below by minus one. And of course, this is totally obvious for the following reason. If you understand the definition of sine and cos, well, it's the x and y coordinates of your position on the unit circle. So this number, or this, sorry, this coordinate in the xy plane is a point on the unit circle centered at the origin. And the unit circle is radius 1, so the biggest these could be is plus 1 or minus 1. Centered at 0, 0. Next, increasing or decreasing. Well, this is a lot more delicate. Of course, neither is overall increasing or decreasing. Certainly not in the whole domains, but if I restrict to certain intervals, they will be. So maybe let's take the graph for cosine and just think a little bit about where it works. So let me just steal my cosine graph. Okay, so for my, my cosine graph, I'm writing it as x versus theta just because it's the x coordinate. I can see it's kind of alternating between increasing and decreasing, isn't it? So in particular, if I'm on one of these, so let me try and get this correct, so I'll change the color a little bit. Don't know how visible this is going to be. So if I'm on one of these intervals, so it's kind of in a darker green, it's not good enough. We're going to have to make this better, I think. Let me, let me, what color would work? I'll do it in blue just to really illustrate the difference. So you can see I'm kind of going back and forth between increasing and decreasing. So on the blues I'm increasing, on the greens I'm decreasing. So what I can see at least in this case is that cosine of theta, so I'll write as that, cos of theta, is increasing so I'm using blue, aren't I? So it's increasing only on certain intervals. So on the interval, for example, minus pi to zero, 
That's the first blue I've written there. Followed by, so the next it would be from pi to two pi. Pi to two pi, and then it would be kind of repeating kind of like that, wouldn't it? So I'm not gonna bother going into a big description of the general case. It's something that you can try yourself if you want. But you can see it's kind of these intervals, so dot, 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 in both directions as well. If you want, one way to think about it, I suppose, is if you take, is if you take this interval here, so this guy, and you shift it by two pi in each direction. That's how you get all the possibles. Um, similarly decreasing, same story, so we'd have cos of theta is decreasing, so I'm using green here, aren't I? It's decreasing. Well then it's gonna be from zero to pi dot dot dot. So zero to pi, and all these other kind of shifts by two pi if you want. So the next one would be two pi to three pi, I think, if we're going in the positive direction. Dot, dot, dot. So yeah, it's the same story, right? You could take, so I don't know if I can actually do it, but you could take this piece, sorry, you could take, yeah, you could take this bit and you'd move it by two pi in either direction and that would give you all possibles, basically. Okay, um, sine, very, very similar. It's worth kind of writing it carefully just for completeness. So for sine, it's kind of shifted a little bit. So the whole thing feels a little bit different. So let me kind of go back to a previous sign and let's grab it. So it's this really nice kind of wave shape. We're here, it, it's very, very similar, but it's a little bit different, I think we can agree. So let me kind of use slightly alternate colorings as well for the increasing and decreasing bits. Don't know if this is gonna work, we'll see. Is that visible? Yeah, it's reasonably good. So it's purple versus magenta. Maybe it's a bit too subtle, but I'll label it in a sec. Okay, so same basic story. So maybe I should just do something here just to illustrate the different. And over here as well. So it's the same basic story. It's just slightly shifted when it comes down to it. So in this case, I'll only draw one of them. So we've got sine of theta, it's increasing. So on the purple, So increasing, so on the first interval that I can see, which is obvious, on minus pi over two to pi over two, you don't really need to memorize these, definitely don't memorize them. You just wanna make sure you really understand the graph so it's pretty easy to read this off dot, dot, dot. And the basic logic is just as before, you'd have this thing and you'd move it, so you'd have the whole thing, and you would move it in blocks of two pi to get every possible. Okay, decreasing, it's all kind of shifted. So sine of theta is decreasing. So this is in magenta. Decreasing on, well the first one I can see, the positive one is pi over two to three pi over two. dot 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 and again what's the story well basically it's it's shifted so for example <laughs> annoying um, what the deal is you're taking this so let me just draw it you're going to take you're going to take this guy and you're going to shift it 
uh, multiples of 2 pi in either direction and that gives you all the possibilities so very nice so it's alternating basically between increasing and decreasing neither of course is increasing or decreasing overall but um, if you restrict a certain intervals there will be so these graphs as well show you something quite interesting that I mean you're incredibly similar graphs aren't you sine and cos are so so similar but it turns out you can easily get sine from cosine if you do some very simple transformations so it turns out the following is true. Um, so cos of theta minus pi over 2, this is actually equal to sine of theta. So they're incredibly closely related. So remember what this is. This is cos of theta. If you're thinking about the graph, it would be translated to the right by pi over 2. one of my elementary transformations. So shall we draw a picture of this to illustrate why? So if I have a graph so if I was to graph let's say cosine to start off with and let's do it between minus pi and pi it's quite a nice idea so if I do it between minus pi and pi, let me mark a few points. Minus pi and pi. It looks like the following roughly. So it goes up, it crosses at pi over two, up to one, and then it goes down. Ooh, I don't like my scale very much here. To there. So that's what cosine looks like. So you can see that in the top guy here. I know it's kind of the scale is a bit squished. It doesn't make much difference. So what happens if I take this and I move it? So actually, let me just, yeah. So if I take this and let's change the color just to make it more obvious is the sign. If I take this and I move it to the right by 3 over 2, I end up with the sign graph. This shows you how unbelievably bad my scale is here because it should be pi at this position. Okay, so this is me shifting to the right. And there are slightly other ways to do it, but this is a nice way to think about it. So again, just to make sure we really understand what all the positions are, this position is pi over, minus pi over 2, and this position here is pi over 2. Okay, very nice. So that's an interesting relationship between sine and cos, so given one you can get the other. Um, what else? What about symmetry? So we already know that we're bounded, so yes, let's do symmetry. Symmetry is a really interesting one. So these are very important, these two properties. They're used all the time in calculus. Cos of theta is an even function. And sine of theta is an odd function. Now, something to say here, th this is a really good reason, or a really, this is a good illustration of the limitations of how you learn some things in high school. Like I've said quite a few times before, often people odd and even fun people think that odd and even functions is just to do with polynomials, and it's just to do with powers of x being odd or even. So it is true that if you take a polynomial, and all the exponents of x are even numbers, that is an even function. But the concept of an even function is much, much broader than that. There are many more examples. 
and this is one, right? Cosine and sine are a very long way from polynomials. They're completely different, and they still satisfy this condition. So remember what it means. This condition being even means that cos of minus theta is equal to cos of theta. That's the meaning of being an even function. Odd, this is the statement that sine of minus theta is minus sine of theta. That's the meaning of being an odd function. So let's see why this is true, shall we? Let's see why this is true. So let's take a unit circle and do it. So forgive me while I go and grab a unit circle. So if I have a unit circle right here, and imagine I've got theta there. So of course, what's the position at the top? Well, by definition, the position at the top is cos of theta, sine of theta, yeah? Well, what about if I took minus the angle? Well, minus the angle is the same thing, basically, but it's winding around. So where are we? It's winding around kind of down here. So it would be minus theta in this direction. So what's this position down at the bottom? This position would be, well, by definition, it would be cos of, it would be cos of minus theta, cos of minus theta, sine of minus theta, by definition. But notice, the x coordinates here are exactly the same. Right? That position there have, and that position there have the same x coordinates. So the same x coordinates. So that means cos of theta is equal to cos of minus theta, i.e. you're even. And the y coordinates are negatives of each other. So negative y coordinates. So what I mean by that is if the y coordinate on top was a half, the y coordinate on bottom is minus a half. So they're negative of each other. Well, that's exactly the statement that sine of minus theta is minus sine of theta, i.e. you are an odd function. Now you can spot this from the graphs. You can spot it from the graphs too by kind of the symmetry, right? So for example, cos has symmetry after reflecting in the, well, the x-axis here, rather confusingly, but in the vertical axis, right? If you reflect, it's the same thing. And similarly, if I rotate this whole thing around by pi, it gives me the same thing. But I would say, important as that is, realizing that, and it's a useful thing to keep in mind, it's almost more important that you understand this specifically because you want to really make sure you have a proper understanding of the meaning of sine and cos. And the reason that these are odd and even functions is, is to do with the unit circle, right? It's to do with your positions on the unit circle given by the points, by the angles theta and minus theta. So it's a really nice example, this. Okay, next, um, let's do, let's do x-intercepts, shall we? So these are positions where cos and theta is zero. So this is actually quite difficult. I think. So x-intercepts. So first of all, shall we... Yeah, let's get a unit circle again. So I'm going to steal this unit circle again. So let's take a unit circle. I'm going to use two of these. And let's remove some of the information. So let's get rid of this. So I just want a clean unit circle. Okay, so let's take a moment to think about this. When is cos of theta equal to zero? Cos of theta equals zero if and only if the appropriate position is where? Well, the only points in the unit circle with x coordinate zero are here and here. 
Those are the only positions where the x-coordinate is zero. So this is the x-coordinate is zero. What about the y-coordinate zero? Well, actually no, let me just focus on the cos for a second. So the x-coordinate being zero is exactly the statement cos of theta is equal to zero. That only happens at these two locations. So how do I describe these locations? First of all, the first one is given by pi over two, isn't it? Yeah. What about the second one? Well, then I could wind around again by a pi to give three pi over two. But remember, there's a lot of repetition when it comes to when it comes to positions. But they all are the same. Essentially, it's always the same. You are pi over 2 around and then some integer multiple of pi. Right? Always the case. So what has to happen is theta must be of the form pi over 2 plus, let's say, k pi, where this k is an integer. because it represents a full half revolution from that top. So a whole number. So that's difficult, right? This is very different than things like, well, any other situation we've been in, basically. Polynomials, for example, can only have a finite number of zeros. If you're degree n polynomial, you have at most n distinct real zeros. Here we've got infinitely many, infinitely many. Similarly, um, for sine, so what's the deal with sine? Well, sine of theta is equal to zero, if and only if what? So that would have to correspond to the x-coordinate being, sorry, the y-coordinate being zero. The y-coordinate being zero happens at two locations, there and there. So that is going to correspond to what? Well, zero, pi, two pi, three pi, four pi. That's going to correspond to theta is well zero i'll just leave that out but a full half revolution or a collection of full half revolutions so we can write k pi here same story just an integer so these are kind of half revolutions if you want in both cases half revolutions and yeah, like I said, these are the only positions. The reason this is all of them is because these are the only positions where the y-coordinate is zero. The only positions where the y-coordinate is zero. So nice. This is this is interesting, right? The zeros of sine and cos, there are many of them. No surprises, though, because you're periodic. You're a wave, so you're repeating yourself over and over again. So if you're zero somewhere, it's going to happen again at some point. So this means, quite obviously, you're massively non-one-to-one. -to -one. So hugely so, because, for example, loads of different things are going to, to zero. So let's just capture that, shall we? So I should also say this is zero business. You could do this with the graphs. If you're particularly, if you really like the graphs, right? If you're really comfortable with them, then of course you can visualize where the zeros are on these. So you can see it here, right? For cos, the zeros of cos, it's well, this, it's the first one, but then it repeats in multiples of pi. So that's a nice way to think about it. And similarly for sine, your zero here, but then you repeat in whole multiples of pi. So that's a totally reasonable way to think about it. Nothing wrong with that at all. It's just I'm really trying to hammer home the definition as a x and y coordinate on the unit circle. So let's just finish up with our with our understanding of with our understanding of one to one. So both of them are massively non one to one. So cos of theta and sine of theta are very not one to one.
They are not one-to-one, -one, massively so. You can see it with the unit circle because loads of different thetas give the same value, all multiples of 2 pi. All multiples of 2 pi, integer multiples of 2 pi give the same value when I add them to the theta, so it's just hugely non-one-to-one. -to -one. If I'm thinking about them in terms of the graphs, I mean, let me just grab the cosine for a second. So we've got cosine down here. It horribly fails the it horribly fails the horizontal line test. Right? If I was to draw a horizontal line through it like this, right, bingo, disaster. It crosses infinitely many points. So not one to one. So we will see it is possible to find inverses to these trigonometric functions, but only in a very restricted sense. Much like when we thought about inverses to x squared, there's no inverse to x squared because x squared itself, thinking about the entire domain, is not one to one. However, if you restrict x squared to be domain or numbers which are greater than or equal to zero, then there is an inverse, namely the square root of x. So we're going to do something very similar later on when thinking about inverses to trigonometric functions. They're not going to be true inverses, they're going to be partial inverses, meaning we'll be restricting to part of the domain where these functions are one-to-one. -one. So this is something we'll see later on. But there we go. Lots of different properties. I think the two things you want to bear in mind are you want to really be familiar with the shapes of the graphs and you really want to be familiar with their meaning in terms of the unit circle. Both of those things are absolutely crucial to truly understanding trigonometric functions.